Right, colleagues, so we continue, and um, I suggest the following, to do the following. I would like to uh, touch upon another topic, which is uncertainty, before we do anything else. Why I'm doing this? So that we have enough time, depending how it goes, uh, our uh, lecture. So we could address other topics uh, afterwards, because maybe you will have questions also about uncertainty, so let's include this into our further discussion. Okay, so I send you email uh, just five minutes ago with this presentation. If you want to follow it on your screen as well, and also I have a presentation about how to write a paper and deal with reviewers. I send it yes, but I sent also the doc file. I'm not sure I sent it earlier. If yes, then it's the same file, so no need to download it. Doc file is a, it's a document. Uh, in five or six pages, which describes this. Right, so uh, let me connect my uh, po pointer. So this presentation is part of our course on modeling theory and uncertainty. And I cannot cover it all, so I will cover some elements. But all slides are still there, so if you want to uh, look at them later, you're very welcome. And the uh, uh, yes, that's it, enough said. So I will introduce why we deal with uncertainty, how do we treat it, and uh, we'll talk about the methods to analyze it, because that's most important. So, let's look at this graph. So, I, I think I already showed it to you. So, imagine your wonderful modeling system forecasts the discharge with this, this dashed line in the middle. And this is single deterministic forecast. So, if water managers have alarm level set up at, at uh, something like 64 uh, for discharge, then this hydrograph would not reach this alarm level. So it seems uh, it's all okay. However, if you assume that your forecast is uncertain, um, and uncertainty here is represented by prediction interval, which is for each value of time is measured on vertical axis like this, then you see that, indeed, this interval would intersect with the alarm level. So it seems you have to issue a warning. So it shows that for decision making, it's important to understand what is the uh, interval of prediction. And of course, in your own life and uh, in any uh, activity of humans, and not only humans, uncertainty is always present, like here. So we have to deal with this uncertainty, and we have to also make decisions under uncertainty. That's a tough thing to do. So uh, this is a citation of one of the papers, which says that, indeed, city officials uh, got uh, estimate of the flood crest on some river in North Dakota in the United States, which was 49 feet, but actual level was uh, 54 feet, so it overtopped dikes, forced evacuation, devastated the city. So after the event, city council member said, if someone had told us that this estimate was not an exact science, we may have better been better prepared. So it's evidence from the field. It seems trivial, but you see that uh, in reality, often these uncertainty estimates are not taken into account. And also managers are quite nervous when uh, they sort of want to deal with uncertainty, but they're nervous when they get uncertain uh, forecasts or uncertain answers, because they say, we want to have clear answer, and why you are giving me uh, the um, uh, uncertain estimate. So there is a contradiction 
uh, in general in dealing with uncertainties. Okay, let's skip this slide. So this is an example, slide 11, where uh, we plotted the deterministic forecasts and we plotted on top the 90% <coughs> uncertainty bounds. And you see deterministic forecasts are um, uh, inside these bounds. And, and these bounds could be very wide. So you see for high levels, it seems narrow peak, but in fact the interval is extremely high. So your uncertainty analysis methods may give you really extremely uh, high, uh, even 90% uncertainty bounds. If it's 50%, it would be narrow, but 90% uncertainty bounds could be really uh, wide. So what to do with them, it's not always clear, because probability that uh, uh, this high peak happens is actually only 5%. Um, so what to do? Shall we trust it or we just think it will never happen? So that's a question. And it, it cannot be answered clearly. <coughs> so uh, interesting statement also that deterministic forecast has the tendency to for force the forecaster to suppress information and judgment about the uncertainty. Because it's easy to hide behind deterministic forecast and say, look, this is the forecast. And the word hide here should be maybe being put in quotes. But in fact, if you pu publish one number only for the public or for authorities, you hide information. It is not correct answer. And it will never be that exact number. So it's lie anyway, you know. Uh, so uh, whole decision making process should be changed, actually, and it's not yet changed. Most models give you deterministic answers, most models. Of course, forecaster, uh, the managers know that this answer is not exact science, so to say. But uh, our tools do not yet give you uh, um, uncertainty uh, forecasts. In meteorology, situation is a bit better because I'm not sure on Brazilian television, but in many countries, forecasts are given with the range. Okay, So you can see that if temperature is forecasted, this uncertainty bound goes wider and wider as we go forward in time. So we have a range. So it is based on ensemble forecasts of uh, atmospheric models. But in hydrology, it's not really done often. In research, yes, but not in practice. So this is for flood forecasting. It's important to uh, also educate uh, 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 the forecasting, the flood managers to deal with the uh, uh, forecasts. Right. Have you done statistical modeling or statistics in your courses? Yes? So perhaps you know all this. So we are considering, so quickly we'll go through this. We are considering 100 observations. It doesn't matter what it is. And uh, we project all these observations on the y-axis. Okay, So there is an x and y. But we are interested in the distribution of these observations uh, for y only at this moment. So there is underlying model that says y is some model of x and then there are some parameters uh, theta. And if we uh, project all this data on y, we get this uh, PDF, probability density function. Okay, So in fact, this PDF is represented as empirical distribution here, which is this stepwise function. And this function here, smooth function, doesn't exist yet. We don't know it. And it's not necessary that this function was used to generate y. We simply want to approximate the empirical distribution by some smooth, nice uh, function. Okay. So, and uh, below, this is the uh, CDF cumulative density uh, d uh, distribution function. Uh, so, real data is no this uh, wobbling curve, and approximating function is this, this one. So what is a quantile? Do you remember what is quantile? 
So quantile is the value here on CDF, let's consider, is the value such that probability to have values in this data set lower than this Q90 is 90%. For PDF, it means that the area under this plot is uh, 0, 0,9, because total area under the PDF is 1. It's a total probability to see data in the total interval. So you see this interval here from 0, 0,32 to 0, 0,43, so it's this interval here on Y. So, <clears throat> in statistical modeling, the main problem solved is this. We want to find uh, mod uh, the model, and model here is PDF. It is not deterministic model. Again, model in statistical modeling is the, uh, the model describing distribution, so PDF or CDF, such that it would approximate this data set in the best possible way. Like we're doing modeling in hydrology, which would represent hydrograph in the post possible way with the minimum error. Same here, we want to minimize error uh, of representing a PDF. Okay? So it's in a statistical sense, uh, this is the, uh, a bit different from what we did for deterministic models. So why it is important? In, pr in principle, since we have computers, we could deal with this table of uh, data here. No problem, we could do it. But often it's nice to have smooth function, especially if it's accurate, which, rep which represents dates, uh, data well. And then, uh, for example, we could sample new data from this function, which would be similar to old data and such like. So, uh, of course, I will not go to details of statistical modeling. You can consult books. There are many, many books on statistical modeling. Uh, which describe how to solve it. Uh, so I took this example from the text which I cite here, McLaughlin, uh, nice text you can find on the internet, very brief introduction to this sort of statistical modeling, and there are papers and there are very good books about this. So if we look at this data, visual inspection s shows that this is uh, the Gumbel distribution, which has this form in, uh, in general, but A and B are the parameters to be calibrated. So we don't know them. So we now have to choose two parameters, which A is mean actually here, and B is standard deviation. These two parameters that we find by minimizing error, similar to calibrating uh, the problem. Again, optimization problem is posed here. So uh, it's good to understand the notion of likelihood. So likelihood of a dat data set uh, shows how likely is that this set of observations, which you see on the right, is sampled by this model F? Okay, how likely, again, that this set is sampled from this distribution? That's likelihood. So in fact, likelihood is probability of observing D. D is data set. So it's a bit vice versa. It's not that we start with uh, 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 data and go to distribution, no. We say, as if we know the distribution, what is the probability that that distribution uh, pushed to sample something, you know, random sampling, uh, generates this set D. So, of course, uh, uh, well, we assume independent sampling. Independent sampling, so this uh, probability to sample certain value is F, which is this function F. And to sample uh, n examples, n data points to this set, uh, is uh, multiplication of all these probabilities, because it's independent, uh, independent uh, events. Again, please remember, we are not looking at x. We have nothing to do with x. We're purely looking at values of y. Okay. So. Uh, what appears that if we set, so if we solve this optimization problem, we, we can find that a mean of this distribution is 0, uh, 0,35. Okay, so this mean is somewhere here. That's the mean. And uh, standard deviation is 0, 0, 0,01984 by solving this optimization problem. 
So uh, we can say these uh, values are optimum. Why? Because any other values being put in that formula, in this formula of Gumbel, uh, would generate uh, the data set which is less likely to be observed. So it's optimum values of this model, statistical model. Um, so let, where is it? Just a second, let me. No, it's not here. Sorry, somehow I'm missing the. Um, ah, y no, where is log likelihood? Uh, somehow it's missing. So anyway, I will tell you, so please uh, believe me, I'm right. So instead of likelihood, often we use log likelihood. Why is that? Because this is, this is probability, F, okay? It's less than one. So if we have 1,000 samples, you have to multiply values which are less than one by each other 1,000 times. You can easily hit the accuracy of the digital computer because you will have very small numbers, extremely small, because you're multiplying every time numbers less than one. That's why we take logarithm of this, and then instead of mul multiplication here, we have simply summation of probabilities. But since it's monotonic function, log function, it doesn't matter what we minimize. Do we minimize likelihood, or we min sorry, maximize likelihood, or we maximize log likelihood? It doesn't matter. So this is what is done just due to the fact that probabilities are less than one and you have to multiply them. So widely you will see in, uh, in uh, uh, machine learning books and statistical modeling books, log likelihood, uh, so it's the same as likelihood, simply logarithm of this is taken. Right, so that's about uh, uh, statistical modeling. So again, statistical modeling is building a model of a distribution that would approximate the data well. And it's formulated, again, in the forms uh, of maximization of likelihood or log, li log likelihood, which is probability of observing data D if we assume it's sampled by this probability F, which we are trying to reconstruct. Of course, uh, we assumed that probability uh, function here has this form. It may have different form. We may assume it's normal distribution and do the same. But normal distribution would have higher error, so to say. It will have less likelihood that this data is sampled from by normal distribution. So Gumbel here is assumed uh, because uh, you have to understand physics of this distribution. So if you don't understand physics, it would be difficult to assume certain distributions. So it's always useful to have you, your expert judgment and to offer distributions uh, which uh, would be reasonable. However, there is also software that runs through 10 or 20 or 100 different distributions trying to maximize likelihood and then it offers to you the best possible distribution plus best possible parameters of that distribution, which is typically mean and standard deviation, okay? In this way, uh, uh, you would have the best possible model that describes data in this set. What did we solve here? Not much. We just have now the mechanism or device uh, to uh, find the formula, nice analytical formula for the distribution. Why do we need it? Uh, we may live without it. However, it's nice to use it to sample more data from the same distribution. If we want to study uncertainty, we'll have a problem of sampling uh, more data from using distributions. That's why it's useful. So, um, <laughs> concerning terminology. So, interesting enough, uh, people, when talk about uncertainty, they also say low accuracy, low precision, high error, thinking it's all the same. But in statistics, uh, uh, scientists invent nice words and they give them different meaning. So let's look at this. Uh, and um, um, maybe it's good to remember that uh, in, in real life it's not important. But when we deal with uh, mathematical modeling, it's maybe good uh, to do it. So consider <laughs> that um, you have a model that predict, predicts some value, and we know the observed value. 
So, and the model is run five times. It's a stochastic model. It doesn't give you deterministic answer. Every time, answer is slightly different. So, model uh, A. So, yes, and there are several models. Let me show you maybe first the plot. Look, one model may give you answer. So this is the value which is observed. And you want to run the model, which would give you more or less the same value. So one model may give you data generated like this. Another model may give you uh, output generated like, uh, not generated, uh, distributed like this around the real value, observed value. Another model may sh say this, uh, being run several times, stochastic model. And uh, yet another model may uh, show you this. Okay? So if we look at numbers, then this model A is called most accurate. Why? Because if you look at the mean of five runs, this mean is closest to uh, the observed value. However, sigma, the standard deviation, is not very low because there is a model, next one, B, uh, with a low standard deviation. So you see this model is low standard deviation. Why this model, if it has low standard deviation, is uh, good or not? No, it's not very good because model C says mean 12 and observed value is 10. Greatest uncertainty is of model D. It is have very high standard deviation. However, mean is quite close to the observed value. But the model is not certain. It every time sort of shoots around observed value, but not too far, actually. That's good. And this model we say most precise. Why? Because standard deviation is lowest here. It's very precise, but it misses the point. So it hits all the time uh, somewhere else, but with very low uncertainty. So it's that model, actually. You see? Very low uh, standard deviation here, variance, very low, but uh, high bias. We say high bias. It's biased, but it's quite a good model, actually. If we correct the bias, it would be the very good model. It would be this, then. So this model has low variance, low bias. That's the best model, obviously. This model has high variance, high bias, the worst model. Okay? And these are in between. This one, which one would you use? I would use this model inst instead of this one. Okay? It has high variance, but if you average it, if you average five runs, you get uh, to hit the point. You see? So in meteorology, Maybe you know there is a notion of correcting the bias. So what happens, meteorological models may give you ensemble meteorological models, so 50 runs in the CMWF or 16 runs in GFS would give you uh, the wobbling answer. So there's some uncertain. So imagine it's a stochastic model which runs several times. It's deterministic, but we imitate st stochasticity by starting with different uh, initial conditions. And there is a bias in this model. So if you know this bias from the past runs, we just correct it and we're done. And then you have a good model, actually. So bias correction is a widely used technique, also in life, you know. When you uh, uh, walk with your closed eyes and you every time don't walk into the door but hit the window next to it, you would correct the bias and then you will walk through the door uh, easily. Uh, like I did today when I hit the glass instead of walking into the door. So. That's uh, good to remember. And we'll talk about how to build models of this bias later, how to correct this bias. That's very important uh, to do in hydrology. It's not often done, but you are invited to do it. Right. So that's a bit of introduction to general stuff, which uh, would be useful to understand. Now, where uncertainty is coming to our models? We talk about model uncertainty. Uh, model, modeling uncertainty, I would rather say. So uncertainty comes from different sources. Yes, by the way, uh, okay. Definition of uncertainty. Webster Dictionary said, not surely or certainly known, questionable, not sure or certainly knowledge, doubtful, not definite or determined, vague, 
liable to vary or change, not steady or constant, varying. Okay, blah, 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 all different words. Some people say uncertain means not certain. And certain means not uncertain. <laughs> Vicious circle, def defining thing through itself. So, but uh, you understand more or less what uncertainty is. So there are different authors that introduce different, uh, different uh, notions of uncertainty. Okay, Zimmerman said, uh, cert uh, certainty implies that a person has quantitatively or qualitatively the appropriate uh, information to describe, prescribe or predict deterministically and numerically its behavior or other phenomena. So it means certainty. Okay, fine. Then uh, Goldby and Samuels from uh, Wallingford, H.R. Uh, uh, Wallingford in England. Uh, actually, I think it's uh, now project uh, flood site uh, in one of the documents. By the way, highly recommended website, floodsite.net. It's a result of a 10 million European project where a lot has been done in terms of flood modeling, flood management, uncertainty in floods. And there is a nice uh, dictionary of uh, terms, glossary and a lot of material, so highly recommended uh, reading. Still, these reports are 10 years old or more, but they're quite valuable. Anyway, so what is uncertainty? A general concept that reflects our lack of sureness. So uncertainty, lack of sureness, sureness of lack of uncertainty, okay. About someone or something, ranging from just short to complete sureness to an almost complete lack of conviction about an outcome. Okay, fine, so let's remember this. Now, to... Uh, important words which sometimes used. T two types of uncertainty sometimes I distinguish. First is called randomness and it's so-called aleatoric uncertainty. So imagine certain thing is random, like rainfall is a random thing, or wind is random. You, you never could say what exactly the speed, it's random value, okay? Second is epistemic uncertainty. We say lack of knowledge. So if we collect a bit more knowledge, this thing becomes more certain. Uh, but often you don't know what it is. Is it uh, aleatoric or epistemic uncertainty? We don't know. W wind is uncertain, but maybe if we collect more knowledge about the atmosphere, it becomes less uncertain, quite possible. Or maybe it's still random. But very often, uh, most natural processes are both random and we don't know everything about them. So there is epistemic uncertainty, lack of knowledge. So it's in general true if you collect more information about anything, about rainfall, about measuring flow and so on, it becomes less uncertain because you know, know more and more about this. So some people say that epistemic uncertainty is better to characterize by fuzzy logic and random uncertainty by probability theory. Okay, I'm not sure. I think both of these technologies are good for anything. They're a bit different. Uh, okay, so also uh, some uncertainty moves from uh, epistemic, so if you have lack of knowledge, you collect data, it was epistemic, not anymore, but it's still random, so it may move to random block. So that's um, something to remember, but not too much, because I think in general, in uh, literature, we, in 90% of cases, we characterize any uncertainty simply by probabilities, and we don't care much if it's random or uh, epistemic or aleatoric. So uh, uncertainty representation, as I said, probabilistic uh, representation, so we assume probabilities uh, associated with any event. And fuzzy logic by Zadeh, 1965, he formulated uh, fuzzy logic. So unfortunately, we don't have uh, much time to talk about this, but it's yet another way to deal with uncertainty to say that your data uh, belongs to the certain interval with a certain membership function and each value could be fuzzy uh, number instead of deterministic number. So if you're interested, to check the books. Uh, it's a lot of material on fuzzy logic. And actually, just last month, uh, Maurizio with co-authors, including me, published a paper in Water Resources Research how to, at, uh, how to assimilate uh, uncertain data described by fuzzy logic uh, into hydrological models. So we made a step from probabilistic, like it's typically done in data simulation, to fuzzy. Okay, so it's one of the ways to characterize uh, uncertain data using fuzzy logic. Also, there is something called interval arithmetics, 
uh, it's close to fuzzy but simpler. So we assume that value is in a certain interval, but don't give any prob probability density function, no membership function, nothing, just interval. So it's sort of uniform distribution, but we don't assume anything actually. So also uh, the whole arithmetic, whole science is built, not science, but okay. Uh, technology is built around uh, interval data. Right. Let's look at this figure. This is our hydrological model, whatever it is, conceptual, whatever. So let's see what uncertainties are surrounding this model. So first of all, output of this model is Y, and it's a model of input and some parameters. Plus, we use an additive uh, here model so that we add different uncertainties here. So these are sort of random values which are associated with different things. So first of all, um, structural uncertainty. S stands for structure. So why? what is structural uncertainty? It's simply uh, lack of good knowledge about physical process that we model. And it means our model uh, is not good enough, as always. It's never ex absolutely accurate. So we say model has a, s uh, 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 has, a uh, has a not bad, but deficiencies in structure. So it means, uh, since we are not running real life case, we run a model instead of real life, we introduce uncertainty to our modeling. Quite simple. So it's called structural uncertainty. When you increase complexity of model, so you improve the structure, uncertainty goes down in most cases, but not always. So we'll talk about this later. Second is theta. So there are these parameters inside the model, properties of soil and so on. We don't know them exactly. There is some uncertainty, so it introduces additional uncertainty based on parameters. Actually, there should be P here instead of theta or here theta. So P and theta is the same thing. Sorry for that. Okay. Now, uncertainty related to inputs. So this input. Input here is rainfall. So if we look at the hydrological model, there's uncertainty in rainfall. We assume some rainfall, but it's maybe not accurate. Okay. And last but not least, uncertainty is output. Why uncertainty is output influencing the overall results? Simply because we used output data, measured data, for calibration, you remember? So if calibration data is uncertain, inaccurate, then your output is also uncertain. This is how uh, output data uh, plays the role. So most of the studies uh, in hydrology of uncertainty analysis concentrate on parametric uncertainty. Questions? If you have questions, please pose now. This is structural uncertainty. Yes, because our structure of the model does not reflect real life well. So that's structural uncertainty. And you cannot do much about it, because if you uh, adopt the slumped conceptual model, that's it. It's always there. So we have to live with this. So most studies look at pro parametric uncertainty, this one, theta or p. So these parameters, you remember in our tank model, we had eight parameters or six, maybe, because initial states. Well, okay. Anyway, also eight. Uh, and also input uncertainty, because, of course, output uh, depends a lot on input, obviously. So if incorrect or uncertain input is fed into the model, then, of course, output is also uncertain. Yes, and let's look at this. Y uh, by the way, I forgot to tell you also, uh, rating curve, so you see this is an example of a rating curve. So why uh, it introduces also a lot of uncertainty? Uh, uh, this is uh, relates to output uncertainty, because the uh, typically we don't measure discharge, we measure river stage or level. And Professor Mindyondo said you had exercises here in the campus number two measuring rating curve or building rating curves. No, it wasn't you. You did? 
in these woods, small pieces of wood, there is uh, some stream. Yes? Okay, it was some time ago, maybe. So you were building rating curves, but look, you were there how many days? A couple of days? Okay, but have you seen flood during that time? Is it a good rating curve? No. But for exercise, fine. But in fact, you have to measure high flows as well. And of course, rating curve in this area is less accurate because it do, there is not much data. You collect the data somewhere here when it's nice stream, but who cares about these streams when there is no flood? So you collect the data about, uh, uh, about irrelevant uh, process, uh, and you didn't collect data about relevant. So that's true for many rivers. Of course, there's much more studies done on big rivers and so on, and, and, and also there is discharge management, so rating curves are not that bad, but uh, introduce additional uncertainty. Okay. By the way, your neural network models may be based not on discharge, but on raw data on stage, on water level, if you find it. So traditionally, data on discharge is published. So this is how you calibrate your models. But maybe it's useful to go to uh, water level data, and maybe your neural network would be more accurate. So physically based models deal always with discharge because this is physically based model. So amount of water coming in should be the same as amount of water coming out. But neural network doesn't care about water balance like this. It looks at numbers and you can easily uh, tra train it on water level. So if you want to predict water level in a river, which is maybe even more important than discharge for people because water level immediately tells you if it's flood or not. And discharge, uh, still, you have to recalculate it back to water level, isn't it? Because you want to tell people where would be the level of the river during the flood, right? So what happens then? You first collect data, uh, in historical data on water level. Uh, then uh, you measure sometimes discharge. You train the rating curve. Then you build this model. And then it predicts your discharge. Then you take discharge, recalculate back to water level, and want the people that water level would be that high. So there is double conversion of an ac uh, through inaccurate device. So if you are able simply directly predict water level, it's not physical because rainfall does not convert immediately to water level; it converts to discharge. And then, but uh, if you use statistical modeling or neural network modeling, you can simply calculate uh, water level. Why not? By the way, in defense of uh, Maria Clara, she looks at water levels in your urban catchment. So she directly calibrates on water level because it's uh, more important for flood prediction. Anyway, so output of your model here is discharge. Output of the model is, of course, one value of discharge, but this is hydrograph uh, drawn for many uh, uh, values. And for every time moment now, since your output is uncertain, instead of one value, which is this red line, deterministic, you would have uh, the discharge uh, probability density function, PDF. How to get to this PDF, we'll talk in a second. But you should realize that you have, since you have PDF, you can uh, uh, draw the interval here, 90%, using 5% quantile and 95% quantile. Distance between these two quantiles gives you 90% probability interval. So it's 90% probability that discharge would be in this range. I see you nodding, nodding. On this positive note, I declare the break. Uh, colleagues in uh, uh, Parana, wh where are they? Group number two? No, group number one. It would be more ref uh, respect. Group number one, we have a break. We are sending you coffee by email, so please enjoy. So we'll convene maybe in 10 minutes. Is it okay? 9.30? As planned. Thank you. <laughs>